We have a Vegas crime story for you. If you've been to Vegas or if you've lived in Vegas, this will catch your attention. It's a new book called Wrong Numbers, Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas. It is written by Glenn Meek and Dennis Griffin. We will talk to Glenn Meek about this fascinating Inside Las Vegas story. Informed, not inflamed. Radio. And hi, everybody. John Daly here with some fascinating Informed, Not Inflamed. Now, many of you know I was a news anchor in Vegas for six years in the 1990s. It is one of the great cities to live in, but also to be a reporter. My guest is Glenn Meek, who was my investigative reporter at Channel 13 in Las Vegas. And he has written this fabulous book about that time in the 1990s. Glenn, welcome to the show. I am really glad to be here and talking to you again, John, and working with you again. And fabulous is the word. That's how we describe Las Vegas. That's exactly right. And uh, always, you're just you're you're one of the best in the business. So it's always good to chit chat with you again. And this book is fabul- uh, fabulous. The book is titled "Wrong Numbers: Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas." It's available on Amazon. Now you write that if Hollywood was to pitch this, it would be Goodfellas meets Risky Business, meets War Games. Give us kind of the main characters in the story and kind of the quick synopsis of it. Well, I'll tell you, one of the main characters is a guy by the name of Vinny Asprins Konjuski. And Vinny <laughs> Asprins is probably one of the best mob monikers in the history of mob nicknames. And it's really funny because uh, according to federal agents, uh, Vinny Asprins got the nickname Asprins because when uh, his crime family would have someone who posed a headache to the mob. Uh, Vinnie Aspins, uh, let's say, uh, got rid of the headache. Uh, and he was one of uh, several people sent here by an alleged mafia associate from, uh, from New York uh, to handle some problems that were going on with some escort services down in Las Vegas. And that's where it gets to be sort of like a three-ring circus here, John. Uh, so you've got these guys, you know, coming out of New York who are alleged uh, mob-connected folks. Uh, you've got, uh, at the same time, the FBI, which is investigating uh, alleged uh, incursion by the mafia into the Las Vegas escort services back in the 1990s. And then you've got the escort services themselves who say that they are being targeted by a mysterious hacker who would divert their telephone calls. And, you know, uh, essentially these escort services or also called out-call entertainment services um, – would nominally be a, a company that would send, let's say, uh, an exotic dance with your hotel room, right? You'd uh, you'd find the, the numbers in the phone book, or you'd find them from these pamphlets that were handed out on the uh, street, uh, Las Vegas Strip, and then you would call this number if, let's say, you wanted some female companionship. And everybody pretty much knows that escort services aren't really there for people to be armed candy, and largely... Uh, these so-called exotic dancers were doing something other than dancer, dancing, unless, you know, you, you consider the horizontal block a form of dancing. So you see what's going on here. Anyway, these services were complaining that um, uh, some sort of hacker was taking their calls. And, uh, you know, let's say you uh, wanted to call Sexy Sally's escort service, and you dialed the number for Sexy Sally's. Well, the phone call wouldn't go to Sexy Sally's. It would go to Swinging Susie. But you wouldn't know that as the uh, as the customer because these places never really identify themselves. They just say, hi, how can I help? That sort of thing. So all these services were thinking, hey, you know what? Uh, my call volume is suddenly dropping. You know, we used to have, a, let's say, a uh, prize fight in Las Vegas, whether it's, you know, like uh, Tyson Holyfield or something like that. And all these services get a lot of business on those weekends. Well, these, these guys suddenly noticed that no one was calling their services. And it was as if someone had hacked into the phone system and triggered the call forwarding uh, features of their phone and then untriggered them after, let's say, an hour. So that they stole a portion of their business, but not all of their business. And so one of these guys that owned a service had some mob connections, allegedly. And uh, he goes and he seeks out a person uh, who is uh, connected with uh, a mafia family in New York and starts complaining about this. And that's why they send these guys down to Las Vegas to sort of sort this out, figure out where this guy is, who this computer hacker is, and if and if and if it's really going on, they want this guy to work for them. Okay, making an offer he can't refuse, so to speak. <laughs> Meantime, you got the FBI who's been looking into whether there's been some compromised uh, local police officers in the vice squad. Uh, they've got a couple. They've got an agent uh, planted in one of the escort services 
uh, pretending to be a manager. And the owner of that escort service is actually working as a confidential informant for the FBI. So you have this other uh, <laughs> interesting angle of what some people would look at and say, oh, my gosh, you know, one of the weirdest undercover operations in maybe FBI history. Are these guys, are the feds running an escort service? Uh, and people looking on the outside look at that and said, mm, it's pretty close to me. <laughs> of course, the fed, the agents say, no, we, we avoided any aspects of prostitution. But there are a lot of people who thought, you know what, these guys look like they're really edging up to the line. Uh, and so that's what was always going on with this book. As the, you know, the feds try to find out what the alleged mobsters are doing. Uh, the alleged mobsters are trying to find out where this computer hacker is, who he is, and how he's doing this. And the escort services are just trying to stay alive. And, you know, they feel like they can't go to the police because, you know, uh, much of their business is actually illegal prostitution as opposed to actual people going in doing exotic dances. So that's what wow. the nature of the thing was. This is, this is, this is like the, the, the definition of FUBAR. <laughs> it was a giant house of mirrors. And again, this is happening in the 1990s when the Internet was relatively new. And yep. no one really knew how to combat cybercrime. Okay? And again, just like any sort of uh, new type of crime, uh, you often see people victimized who are in a business that's either illegal or quasi-legal. A lot of people consider these places quasi-legal. That, you know, yeah, they're legal on paper, escort services, alcohol entertainment services, yes, they're legal on paper, but what normally really happens with these is something that's not legal, it's illegal. So you had a lot of people weren't, who were reluctant to go to the cops. So, you know, uh, some of these people, they went to the next best thing. They went, you know, to mobsters or someone else that they thought was going to be able to sort of uh, sort this thing out uh, to help wow. them. And uh, that's why this thing got really uh, complicated, and the FBI had a hard time following who was going where and, you know, who might really be doing this. Wow. And they and they could have gotten sucked into it as well. I want to get more into the story. But I, I, what what to me is 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 how fascinating this is that it's just really being revealed. Now, how did how did you and Dennis actually stumble onto the story that happened almost 20 years ago? Yeah, actually, uh, John, I covered this originally when it happened in 1998 in Las Vegas. And uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a number of arrests uh, and indictments. And eventually, all of the uh, all of the players t took plea bargains, and they all went to prison. Uh, so a lot of this never came out because there was no trial. Uh, I have been fascinated by this since it happened because it was one of the first times that I actually ran into cybercrime. And again, it was it was a fascinating cybercrime because you also had this, you know, it wasn't just you know cyber crooks, you know, putting skimmers in uh, in ATM machines to record. Uh, credit card numbers. Th th these were people intercepting uh, phone calls. You're talking about possibly the telephone system, at least at that time, uh, being uh, subject to hackers and in the very integrity of our phone calls, whether they're business calls or people, you know, if you can, if you can divert one, you can, you can listen in. Uh, so there was this whole idea of intercepting and redirecting phone calls and, and the idea of whether or not law enforcement at that point was prepared to deal with something like that. And, and frankly, it doesn't appear at that point they were. And so a lot of things actually happened as a result of this. People started to take this, this sort of crime uh, more seriously uh, and mm -hmm. also look at how it might uh, be used to, you know, victimize people who don't feel comfortable going to the cops. Hmm. We are talking to Glenn Meek. He's an investigative reporter who worked with me in Las Vegas, along with Dennis Griffin. He has written this book called Wrong Numbers, Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas. You can get it on Amazon. And, Glenn, you you can also get it off your website. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, it's on the Wild Blue Press website. That's the publisher, Wild Blue Press. It's uh, one word, Wild Blue, and then press second word. But, yeah, uh, they have it on the uh, website as well. And some other stuff. You can look on the website, not only see the book, but we have some photographs there, some of the uh, mug shots and some of the various people who got uh, – uh, busted in this case, and uh, also some other uh, peripheral uh, people who, uh, who who surfaced during the uh, investigation. Okay, um, and also you you sent me a great link in the video. I'll actually put that on some of the posts. Is that video also uh, on on any of the websites? Not yet. Uh, that we just actually completed that, so uh, you're one of the first to get that. But that, that that video does. It's about two and a half minutes, under three minutes. It really sort of tells the story of what's going on, and you can uh, 
you know, you can see who the players are and, and how this works and also hear from some of the people who are actually involved out there. We have some uh, what we call sound bites or uh, audio clips from uh, some of the retired FBI agents who worked at uh, you can hear some of the uh, conspirators uh, uh, talking about some of the things that were going on. Wow, that's that's what's that's what's so fascinating. Cool. All right. Cool. Um, I'll 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 post it on there when we when we post this interview. Um, just if we can go go back to the fact that again this happened twenty years ago and you're just coming out with the book. Why is that? Is it that people are just finally talking about it, or is it we're finally just understanding? Because you were you were working on this for so long. How come the book just comes out now? Well, I'll tell you, I spent about you know twenty years actually collecting uh, evidence on this because again, it all didn't come out in a trial because there was no trial. Everybody took a plea bargain, people went to jail, and, and people forgot about it. Now we've got uh, the agents, all of the agents, for example, who are involved have now retired. So they feel, uh, you know, more free to speak about what had happened. Um, we even talked to one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, guys who was caught up in the in the crime and actually did prison time in that. And mm-hmm. so people are just they're they're less reluctant to talk about it. Uh, over the course of the years, also I've been able to just you know collect more and more and more on this just because I was fascinated by it. And uh, it was one of those things that just sort of sort of happened. And then I had been actually. Uh, talking with Dennis Griffin, uh, Dennis' act, act, role was more essentially as an advisor and editor on this. He did not cover it back in the day. He is a true crime author, but he had a, uh, a residence here in Las Vegas where he would you know, spend summers. He was kind of a snowbird type uh, person. And uh, you know, he and I would every now and then uh, talk on the phone. We never actually met, but he interviewed me for a book that he did uh, regarding the days of uh, Tony Spilatro from the Chicago outfit, that organized crime organization. And uh, I had covered a, a specific case involving uh, Tony Spilatro, and, and Dennis actually interviewed me. So we became friends. And when, when, I, when I thought, you know what, it's time to do a book on this, the uh, first person I contacted was Dennis Griffin, and he said, no, it sounds great, let's do it. And that's how it all, wow. that's how it all came. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's very cool. Um, so when, when, I, when I look at this whole thing, to me, uh, my take on this is that, you know, the 1990s were a boom time and it, it was also the opening to the 21st century. So I guess, is it safe to say old Vegas, you know, the fast money, the call girls and the mob ended up meeting the new world technology and, and this new economy? And it, is that kind of what happened here if you look at it kind of at the 30,000 foot level? Oh, I, yeah, I don't even think you have to be flying that high, John. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think you hit it right on the head. That is exactly what this is. And it's another reason why I wanted to write a book about this, to sort of connect these two eras, the old school mob methods versus the new cyber crooks, okay? And how these two, uh, these two cultures collided, uh, because that was, it was the end of the old way versus the new way. In fact, uh, a tech writer uh, by the name of John Markoff writes for the New York Times. He used to, I don't know if he still writes for the New York Times. But, you know, he, he more or less, uh, you know, uh, capsulized it as saying, you know, it's the newest technology meets the oldest profession. And that was something that I thought was really unusual as well. Uh, and in fact, you know, we'll, we'll deal with this probably a little bit later in the interview, but, you know, that's really what, is, what was happening with these, with these services. What it was, it was, it, was the, uh, it was the modernization and practically industrialization of the world's oldest profession with these services. Uh, as you, yep. remember, you remember, John, in the phone books, there would be these full-page ads for these escort services or alcohol entertainment services, and they would be 150 pages of these things that were in the yeah. phone book, and they were very lurid originally. Uh, and uh, you know, eventually they toned those down because people were complaining. You know, the phone book is in every house. <laughs> you know, kids go in there to look up the you know where's the closest pizza parlor, and they're they're running across <laughs> all these full-page color ads for escorts. You know. With, with things saying like, you know, uh, blonde Asian MILFs want to meet you tonight, you know, and so people were, you know, were upset by that. And they ended up actually toning those ads down where they didn't show any actual human beings in, in the ads, but they let them stay in the phone books for a long time. Of course, now, uh, you know, Facebook has supplanted the phone book. So, you know, the phone books are almost, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're even more passe than a fax machine. But in those days, that was, that was where the advertising was. And that's where they advertise. Wow. And of course, it's, it started switching and it led to this. Is, is, is any of this stuff 
going on today in Las Vegas? Um, there are people that allege that it is. Um, but again, the alcohol services are not nearly as prevalent as they used to be. There are some still. Uh, you know, there were a lot of these uh, websites. You know, one of them, actually, the FBI took down. One was called Backpage. I think there's another one called Redbook. That may still be online. There were a lot of apps that came out now so that these uh, these women and some men, but generally these women, uh, who are applying their trade, uh, you know, they didn't have to work for these services and go through some of the sham as a dancer or what have you. Uh, now there's a lot more direct connections being made over the Internet. And there's different apps that connect people, you know, who provide sex services for those that want to want to get it. But back in the old days, that wasn't the case. You know, the call girl racket was dependent on, on calls and the calls came from the phone system. And if you had a way to hack into the phone system and control the calls, you could control a multi-million dollar underground industry. And that's what people were alleging was going on. The question was, who was doing it? How were they doing it? And, and how do you find them and get them to either stop if you're the cops or work for you if you're a, you know, a crime syndicate? Wow. So could, um, so technically, uh, could this not only still be going on today, but could it, could this hacking be going on today? Could somebody be doing that? Or is it, is, has it, because the FBI has cracked down on so much of this and there is so much call girl prostitution that is going on that it's kind of just small pockets or small, small organizers, workers that are doing this and it's, it's totally different. That's an excellent question. I think, you know, certainly it's much, 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 much less dependent on the phone system. Okay. Virtually, you know, everything goes over the internet now. So, you know, all these hookups uh, mostly are being arranged through the internet. Although there are still people who like to call a service, you know, to, and they, and I think they do that because they have this illusion that, oh, it's a, it's a licensed business in Las Vegas. So it, these girls must be legit. Or, you know, at least you know, nobody's going to roll me if I, if I make a date with them. But again, a lot of these people now are hooking up directly through other different kinds of applications. So I think it's less centralized. You know, it's, uh, uh, but could it be going on? Possibly. And it, the problem is, who would know? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's so much decentralized now. Who would know? Because you've got these individuals either getting, the, you know, hooked up with other people or they're not. And it could be going on and you wouldn't know. Probably more likely that you wouldn't know today than you would then, because in those days, most of these women worked for services. And so the services noticed that their business was was dropping. But all these other people now, they're independent contractors, you know, going through an app. You know, do they know whether their their business is dropping or do they never get the business because every third call is being stolen by somebody on the Internet? It's really, I would think it'd be really hard to tell. And again, you've got that problem of what do you do if you're a prostitute, go and complain to the police that you're, you're not getting calls from your johns? I mean, <laughs> what do you do? That's what makes yeah. it such an easy target for people to you know, exploit. Well, and it's fascinating, too, that they, you know, they knew, hey, we're not getting the business. Something's going on here. And, you know, so they were probably pretty good businessmen in that respect. They, they could see the revenues were dropping and they needed to do something. Talk talk about briefly about the, 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 the one guy they would bring in, the fixer or the driller. What, what was he? Who, who was the guy that came in? That's Vinny Asprins. You know, and the joke about Vinny Asprins was that, uh, you know, he could not only take care of a headache for the mob, he could cause one uh, because uh, his reputation was that he used a cordless drill. Uh, to either drill into a person's head or drill into their kneecaps uh, to get him to tell him what he wanted to know. At least that was the reputation that he fostered. Now, it is absolutely true that when they arrested all these guys, they found a cordless drill in Vinnie Aspen's luggage. Now, you know, uh, as one FBI agent told me, you know, that's not the sort of thing uh, you bring on vacation to Las Vegas. (laughs) <laughs> so it was, uh, it was quite the uh, quite the thing to discover. Uh, now, whether he ever actually used that, you know, I've been told by some of the people who actually knew him that now nah, it was just something that uh, it was a, it was a convenient, um, you know, sort of a sort of a convenient rumor to have floating around you if you needed to get things done and uh, you know get people who didn't want to talk to you to talk to you. But nonetheless, uh, he certainly did have a drill when they uh, 
when they arrested him, it was in his luggage. Uh, he didn't have it out using it, but he, he did have it in his luggage. <laughs> uh, British tabloids, they actually uh, dubbed him the driller killer. Um, he himself now, he died in prison, actually, uh, while serving a sentence for this caper. Wow. We are talking to Glenn Meek. He's an investigative reporter who worked with me in Las Vegas, along with Dennis Griffin. He has written a book called Wrong Numbers, Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, Glenn, I know when you and I were reporting together, the mob was kind of losing its grip, at least from the gaming industry. Is there still some form of organized crime happening there? I mean, all places have crime, but is there, is there any form of organized crime there in Las Vegas now? Yeah, there's organized crime in Las Vegas. Uh, there's organized crime probably in every major city. I think the uh, what you're looking at here now, though, in Las Vegas and probably most of the other major cities, is transnational uh, organized crime, which as opposed to, let's say, the old-fashioned La Cosa Nostra or the mobsters that we were familiar with from, you know, Goodfellas and that sort of thing. Or even Las Vegas' you know, own roots. Uh, with, you know, the Kansas City mob and the uh, Chicago outfit and some of those you know, <laughs> traditional uh, American uh, mob groups. Uh, very little of that left in Las Vegas anymore. There might be some isolated pockets there for a while. There were some of those guys that were doing, you know, things with, you know, uh, topless clubs, uh, you know, uh, things having to do with the sex industry. For some reason, that, that's one of the things that they, they were very interested in and were very successful at for the longest period of time. But, but, from what I have seen and in, in talking and in both, you know, covering it and talking to uh, law enforcement officials, you know, and then having some experience myself, as you know, I was an investigator for the federal public defender's office for seven years. Mm-hmm. We, we had some of these people as clients who were uh, accused of being part of these transnational crime organizations. Uh, you see a lot of uh, credit card fraud, especially those associated with some of the uh, former states of the former Soviet Union, uh, you know, people that have, you know, these forgery laboratories that are making uh, phony credit cards after stealing people's, you know, confidential information, social security numbers, things of that nature. You see a lot of that, which is organized. Uh, and then you also see, of course, you know, uh, human trafficking. You see uh, some of the um, some of the uh, Asian uh, organized crime groups, triads, uh, very involved in human trafficking, bringing people to this country either to be uh, prostitutes and, you know, hidden underground brothels or, um, you know, maybe people are not going to be necessarily you know, forced into prostitution, but they're, you know, they end up working in uh, very low wage jobs and uh, restaurants and, and whatnot. They don't speak English. Uh, they're beholden to the uh, smugglers that brought them over. You see a lot of human trafficking uh, from some of the Asian gangs. And then there's the drug cartels. You know, uh, we just saw what happened with El Chapo's uh, son. I mean, they, yep, you know, yep. the drug cartel down there back down the federal authorities. I mean, that just shows you, you, you know, both how sophisticated and, and how powerful some of those crime cartels have gotten down there. And, you know, you remember, John, when we were, were doing, you know, the news back in the 90s in Las Vegas, it seemed like every other day you would hear about, for example, a meth lab exploding in a neighborhood yep, yep. Uh, in, in a um, trailer park or even in a hotel room. Now you never hear about that. And the reason is because all that meth is primarily being manufactured in giant laboratories down in Mexico and then imported up here in the United States. So you don't, you don't see that kind of uh, meth lab activity in America anymore because it's just, you know, volume and uh, low cost uh, drugs, you know, pouring in uh, from Mexico. So, you know, yeah, the, you, you see the transnational groups that are involved in this stuff, primarily, like I said, you know, drugs, human trafficking, and uh, credit card uh, fraud and identity theft. So does does Vegas uh, and, and and people are going to be listening because and I always tell people, you know, Vegas is a great place to go live. Is this dangerous for the average person in there, or is this just in 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 separate areas that people would say I'm not going to go near there? You know, I you know it's not you, well. I mean, if you're down on the strip, you're you're pretty well protected. You know, uh, and there, there is certainly any any big city in America and, and Las Vegas has become a big city, which it wasn't that big of a city when when you were here working uh, with me in the old days. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there are certain places. But, I mean, drugs are, you know, unfortunately, drugs are surging throughout the in, in, entire country. Uh, we might have probably and I don't have any statistics to back this up. This is just speculation on my part. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, this is the kind of place because we have so many hotels, so many casinos, uh, you know, where you got people that are, you know, using uh, high amounts of credit, things of that nature, that you might have a, there might be more of a danger of, you, uh, you know, pin getting a compromised or a scam. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would suspect that there's maybe a, a incrementally higher a danger of that, but not, not generally. It's, you know, um, any more than anyone else. That's the problem. You've got, you know, this stuff is really widespread anymore, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So when you go to Vegas, check your credit card is what you what you what you're saying actually what people need to do. Well, you should do that no matter where you go on vacation, but it's a vacation spot. And that's you know, people tend to grab, you know, some of these grifters and some of these people that are that are, you know, trying to victimize people, they do tend to try to um, you know, aggregate in in tourist spots. And you know, whether that's you know, a Cabo down in Mexico, whether that's Las Vegas or you know, um whether that's any other uh, tourist, uh, big tourist town. But we are a big tourist town, and people do use a lot of credit uh, here. And so it's something definitely to be, you know, something cognizant of, just, you know, protect yourself to the extent that you can. All right. Um, talk, talk briefly, because we, we mentioned about prostitution, and everybody seems to have this idea, oh, Nevada allows prostitution. Um, in Las Vegas, which is Clark County, uh, prostitution is illegal. Now, if you go to Nye County, Pahrump, it is legal out there and it's regulated. Um, so what what's interesting is, is that I can remember an undercover investigation you did on prostitution. And to me, it was one of the most amazing stories. And it's one of the stories I remember most about my time in Vegas, because uh, there was a young woman who the cops nabbed uh, in the midst of soliciting um, sex in a hotel room. And this, this gal, this, she looked like a farm girl from Kansas and she actually allowed you to interview her on camera in the hotel room. G give us a scenario. And does stuff like that actually happen today? That's another good question. I tried to uh, sit down with some, uh, uh, Las Vegas metropolitan police people, uh, to interview them about that and see what the differences are today versus, uh, in the past, in the past, it was a it was a really big deal. These outcall services that we talked about, you know, they had 150 uh, pages in the yellow uh, in the yellow pages in the phone book. They had all these uh, pamphlets being handed out by armies of you know what they called smut peddlers, or some of them were called hand billers. You remember that? Anybody who's been to Las Vegas for the last 20 years probably seen them on the strip. There are a lot less of those now. And in fact, when I checked. Uh, just to see how many licensed, you know, escort service slash alcohol entertainment services there were. Uh, like about, a, there's a, maybe a third of as many as there used to be, or maybe even a quarter. So the services are not as, as prominent as they used to be. And again, I think that's because, you know, the people who want, sex workers who want to get their services marketed are going either directly to the internet or using apps or some other you know, websites that they can hook up with people on. So you don't see that sort of, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, personal interaction there. Uh, whether that's still going on, uh, what they call these, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure whether Metro police do what we call room setups, and that's what you're talking about there. That's where the Metro vice detectives would go undercover. They would rent two rooms in, let's say, a major hotel. And in one room, they would put an undercover officer pretending to be a John, pretending to be some guy in town from out of town, um, and he would call one of these numbers from the phone book or one of those pamphlets and get a woman to come up to his room and then see whether she was just going to do a dance or, or you know, uh, propose sex. And that's what that, that, that's what we did in that particular case. They had an undercover camera in there. We were monitoring from the, the adjacent room. And of course, that's the first thing she does. She comes in. She literally says, we're not here to dance. <laughs> we're, you know, <laughs> dancing gets us into the rooms. And then, you know, the guy, oh, yeah, that's great. And then they talk. She says, okay, I got to get agency fee. And that's for those escort services. The service gets a, a, a fee. It was in those days, I think, $250 right off the top. And she says, okay, now I'm just going to put this away. That's for the service that refers me. Now you and I can make a deal for whatever you want all night, two hours, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's what they would do. And then these Metro detectives would have all this being recorded on hidden camera. They're monitoring in the next room. And then uh, actually they would usually let the woman, uh, 
take off all their clothes, and then they would rush in. And of course, the phenomenal explanation for that was that, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure she didn't have any weapons on her. And that uh, also, they didn't think that she would be more docile uh, and, and not, you know, try to hurt anybody or try to dash out the door um, in that condition. So that's what they would do that. And then they'd bring them in, you know, the other officers when they come in, they'd book them. After that happened in this particular case, you know, they asked her, they said, look, do you want to uh, talk to this guy about it? And she agreed to do that. And she talked about just, you know, primarily how much money she was making. She was just, you know, she said it was just astonishing, uh, you know, the amount of money that she was making. And of course, all of that part is part of the underground economy. Nobody really knows in an aggregate how many all these people that were working uh, just like she was in those, in those, you know, roles as a prostitute. Nobody had any idea how much of this underground money was, was flowing, but it, it was obviously a lot because they were paying for, you know, these full page ads in the, in the phone book ran like $3,000 a month. So you got 150 of them. You can see that's a lot a month, you know? Yeah. Wow. We are talking to Glenn Meek. He's an investigative reporter who worked with me in Las Vegas, along with Dennis Griffin. He has written a book called Wrong Numbers, Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Glenn, as I, as I read the book, this has got Hollywood written all over it. The 1990s to me is becoming nostalgia for a lot of people. A- anyone from Tinseltown talking to you about this? Well, you know, the book just uh, was just published uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, you know, certainly, I think anybody who writes a book, you know, hopes eventually, uh, you know, Hollywood's going to take an interest in it. Um, but one of the reasons I wrote it was exactly what you articulated. Uh, one, the, the 90s, uh, there is a bit of nostalgia about the 90s now. Um, it is a very unusual mob story. You know, I think it's one that I think that younger people will appreciate because, you know, they're into computers and uh, data processing and, and they're concerned about, you know, hacking and that sort of thing. Um, it's not a typical, oh, this is some wise guy who grew up in the 50s, you know, in the heyday of the mob or whatever, and it's his, you know, uh, single-source tell-all memoir. This is a more uh, sophisticated story involving, you know, this clash of cultures between the old style and the new style and cyber crooks versus, uh, you know, uh, mob methods of crowbars, you know, um, versus hard drives. Uh, and, and that's another reason why, you know, I decided to write a book because I thought it would be, be a nice way to bridge those two generations. Yeah, nicely done, really. Um, so you're still living in Vegas. We, we talked a little bit about the difference of, of the crime or the crime that's still happening there. Give me your impressions of the city today and, and, and how different it is for someone who lives there now compared to maybe years ago, someone like me, as far as just, just living there, is it, I, I know it's booming and it's growing. Is, is it, is it better or is it totally different? Um, you know, Las Vegas is always, always reinventing itself. So every, you know, certainly every generation, or maybe every 20 years or so, there's a completely different Las Vegas. Um, it is absolutely, I think, different from when you and I were there. And I came in in the mid-80s, and it was, you know, the explosive growth was ongoing at that point. But there was still a lot of the old vestigial um, Vegas-type atmosphere around. I mean, you could go to a place like Binion's Horseshoe and meet all these crazy characters in the middle of the night having their $2 steak and eggs. Uh, you know, everybody comped everybody. Everybody knew somebody in the casino business. And, you know, if you wanted to show, you picked up a, a phone and said, hey, can you give me two tickets to this? And, yeah, you had two tickets waiting. It will call for you. Uh, now, you know, they charge for everything. Uh, the strip is really, it's a fantastic thing to see, but it's not the strip that, you know, I knew when I, when I first got here. I mean, now it's just these huge, uh, you know, towering um, resorts with fountains and, you know, canals and you know, volcanoes and uh, all this stuff and, you know, giant laser beams everywhere. Uh, so the, it, it's more of a, you know, a, a glossy uh, entertainment uh, capital. Um, you know, the entertainment, when I first got it, was in the showrooms. So you had to go inside to see the entertainment. Now you get these uh, 300 foot, you know, fountains shooting of water everywhere, and, you know, fireworks and all that stuff. Um, so it is, it, to me, it's radically different. 
Um, but but that's the nature of Las Vegas. It is always reshaping itself. Um, so I guess that's just something you expect living here. You know, I don't go down to the strip that often uh, anymore. Uh, when I do, I'm, I'm always amazed with so many new things that I wasn't even aware of. But, um, you know, you know how it is, John. People who live in the city don't live on the strip. That, you know, people yep, think, yep. oh, my gosh. You know, that's, that's, that's not like downtown New York where there are apartment complexes. Although it's, downtown is becoming more like that. There, there's a lot of places where people are living. And that's actually becoming sort of like a hipster haven. And that, to me, has been a wonderful uh, change. Uh, you know, it's revitalized downtown. There's lots of really great, uh, you know, bars that appeal to the younger people. And, uh, you know, they've, they've, um, they've uh, taken some of the old buildings down there and rehabbed them. And uh, it's downtown now. It's really undergone a renaissance. And I, I really enjoy going down to uh, downtown, especially the East Fremont part of it now. They've got a lot of really what, uh, what? entertaining places. Mm-hmm. What I've seen is the artwork there is just is is amazing in the downtown area um, and and the different places kind of just off there uh, that you're starting like off Charleston. You're you know, it's becoming almost like an art mecca for outside big art. And, uh, you know, I, I was actually joking to somebody the other day. I said, oh, we can call this Melrose on Main. This is a section of Main Street, which used to be just like, you know. You know, places for winos to curl up in, you know, empty uh, uh, doorways. Now, I mean, they've got these, uh, you know, mid century modern shops. They've got uh, second, cool second hand shops, you know, sort of like Buffalo Exchange, these kind of, you know, uh, retro clothing places, uh, decent restaurants, good bars, um, and you know, coffee shops, you know, and not just, you know, um, chain coffee shops. I mean, you're talking about really old fashioned, you know, beatnik style coffee shops it's really neat it's almost like Melrose avenue you've got all these really kind of funky uh, clothing and uh, antique shops at the same time you've got some uh, modern uh, restaurants and whatnot on there yeah that particular section right there like around maine and charleston yeah that has really really transformed itself and i am again i i'm uh, i i am very happy with the way that's turned out and i go down there on a, on a fairly regular basis they have a thing called first fridays now down there uh, it's a big, they close off all the streets. It's kind of like make the whole area, pedestrian area. It's it's really nice. I mean, they've, they've done a, a lot of things that, you know, for the first 15, 20 years I was here, thought would never happen. Um, but they finally got around to doing it. And, 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 it re- and those parts of the city, I think, are really, really great. Has it lost the sort of small town, rat pack, Ocean's Eleven charm? Yeah. But there's something new to replace it. And I think it's something that probably... Uh, a younger generation appreciates. Uh, wow. Well, I think uh, for my for my other show, Undercover Jet Setter, my travel food and wine show, I think we need to bring you down there and you need to give us a tour of that because that would be absolutely perfect. I would love that. Uh, I'm proud of it. I didn't have much to do with it, but I, I you know, it's, it's my <laughs> city for the last 30 some odd years. And I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of how the community has come together and done that. No, cool. Well, thanks for, thanks for that little tour there, and we will get you on Undercover Jet Setter to do that. We have been talking to Glenn Meek. He's an investigative reporter who worked with me in Las Vegas along with Dennis Griffin. He's written a book that you should pick up. It's called Wrong Numbers, Call Girls, Hackers, and the Mob in Las Vegas. It's a great crime story, and it just, it, it'll just it tell you about the history of Las Vegas. It'll also tell you about a, a lot of the history of how technology changed uh, especially in the in the uh, 1990s there and what, what happened as we got into the 21st century. You can get it on Amazon. Glenn, always great to talk and reminisce with you. Good luck with the book. Right back at you, John. I really enjoyed being on the show. And folks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can catch me on Facebook at Inform Not Inflamed and John Daly's Las Vegas and on Twitter at John Daly News and check out our show, Undercover Jet Setter. We have plenty of travel, food, and stuff like that on Las Vegas. All you have to do is go to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash undercover jet setter. We will catch you next time. For more on John Daly, go to informednotinflamed.com. <laughs> <laughs>